Hello. Hey, okay. What is up, collective youth? How are you guys doing tonight? Ooh, all right. You guys sound excited. I like it. Well, we're going to play a game today called Stick It or Miss It. As you can tell by the face, this is going to be epic, right? You guys excited? Thank you. Excitement. That's what I like to hear. All right. So I need everyone to stand up. You guys listen so well. I'm so happy right now. This is good. All right. I'm going to play a clip. At the end of that clip, it's going to pause, and you're going to decide whether the person stuck it or missed it, like an epic fail, all right? And if you think it was an epic fail, stand on your chair. Stand on top of your chair so we can see who's choosing what is what, all right? And we'll decide from there. If you don't get it, we'll sit you down. We're going to see who's the last person standing, the last people standing. Everyone got it? Cool. All right, let's play that first clip. All right, you guys think he stuck it or missed it? We'll give you some time. If he missed it, stand up. Oh, all right, no one think, oh, a few people think he missed it. What do you think? Right now, it kind of look like doing a little weird, about to flip over, we don't know. All right, we'll play the next clip and find out right now. Oof, he stuck that. That was clean, all right. So for the few people who stood up, sit down. We'll try next week, and we'll get the next clip. Whew. All right, what do you think? Did he think he stuck that one or he missed it? Wow, everyone thinks he missed that one. Oh, everyone thinks he missed that one. Everyone. Ooh, all right. Few people don't think he missed it. That, that looks pretty epic, right? All right, let's find out if he stuck it. Ooh. I know, I, I felt that one. I felt that one, that one hurt. Yeah, everyone's out. Everyone's out. The few winners are still in here. I see a couple of you, you guys are still there. Nah, I'm joking, everyone's still in. Next video. Chris, you're, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. You're the pastor, you're fine. You think he stuck that or missed it? You're fine there. If he missed, you're on your chair. If he stuck it, you're standing. Everyone thinks he stuck it. One, two people think he missed it. Three people? Two? Three? Three people. All right, let's see if he made it. He stuck that one. That, one. that one's pretty clean, too. I can tell you right now, I can't ride one of those. If I did it, I'd be falling everywhere. Let's play the next clip. All right, all the soccer people in the house. I don't know many of you. I know David plays soccer. Anyone else play soccer? Who? Wow, a lot of people. All right, cool. I don't. I'm terrible. Do you think he stuck it or missed it? He landed it. I think two people think he landed it or missed it. All right, she thinks she missed it. Three, three people, four people. All right, let's see if he made it. Oof. All right, that means like four people are left. The last remaining few. Aren't you guys sisters? You know what, they think so alike. Next video. Okay. You think he landed that one? I know some people have that feeling in the stomach right now. I don't think he... I don't know. That, that, that just makes me nauseous. Let's see if he landed that one. No, he did not land that one. There's no one remaining? Everyone... You were the last two. I had so much faith. I think there's one more. I think there's one more video, maybe? Last one. Last one. One more? Oh, you have one more? Okay, you're still in. Do you think he stuck it or missed it? You're the last one. You think he lands it? All right, we'll find out right now. Ooh. He did not land that. You know what? That was a valiant effort from everyone. We got to see some people in pain. It was fun. Now let's get ready for the rest of the service. I love you guys. Enjoy it. There we go. Sorry to keep you waiting. We were discussing things that didn't matter backstage, so welcome. Yes, there we go. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to have you guys here again. Week number two of BNCY Live. Excited? I'm excited, too. I'm excited. You even let me come up here. Well, listen, guys, we, we are, you know, we, we say this every week and uh, that you are a gift to us. And I don't know if you've ever been a gift to anybody, in all honesty. 
Like to be a gift to someone, come on, think about this for a minute. When you are a gift to someone, it's like they're like this. Right? They can't wait to see you and be with you. And that's what it is when you guys show up. And, and when you're here, we look out and see you and we're talking to you and we just, especially those new faces that are coming, we're so grateful that you're here today. And the reason that you guys came, maybe you should get out of the house, I don't know, but one of the big reasons that we hope you came is so you can hear the truth of the gospel. And that's what we, I mean, that's what we teach, you know what I mean? So we, all the games, wherever, Ellie, you did a great job with the game, we love him, but it's capital T truth that we want to give you, because that's what's going to grow you, that's what's going to teach you, that's what's going to lead you, it is all about God. And the last thing we want to remember is this is that when you come in here and you're feeling like, ah, we always say it's okay not to be okay, right? But what? Thank you. You don't want to stay in that not okay place. And guess what? God doesn't want you to stay there either. He loves you so much and he wants to see good things for you. And so when you come here and you're feeling a little cruddy and you're feeling a little out of sorts, guess what? When you walk out of here, we're praying that... chosen thus says the lord who made you who formed you from the womb will help you fear not O jacob my servant Jer jerusalem who i have chosen
to this. Oh, yeah, there I am. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I, I really feel I should say this tonight, even before we really get into Scripture or whatever, but I, I want you to know, that if you're here in this room, I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that we love you, that this church loves you and believes in you, and I don't know, there might be some people in this room right now that maybe feel kind of out of place or, I don't know, maybe with all the chaos going on in this world, you, you kind of feel like, almost like worthless. We're, gonna, we're actually going to get more into it in the scripture, but I want, I want to begin tonight by telling you that 
you are worthy. In fact, you know how, how much, how worthy you are? You're worth God's one and only son to die for you. So tonight, um, let me pray for you one more time because we're about to get into some real stuff. So let me pray. God, I just pray that you would just be with us in this room, Father. God, I pray that you would just soften our ears, Jesus, soften our hearts. God, I pray that we would leave this place just closer and, and more engaged in a relationship with you, Father. We love you. And everyone said amen. Come on, say amen. amen. All right. This is going to be kind of awkward because of the large distance. But if you have to shout, shout, turn to your neighbor on your left and say, hey, you look good tonight. Okay, shout if you have to. On the left, you look good tonight. All right. Go all right now to your other neighbor and say, I know. All right. So remember, I know, yes, all of you guys look amazing. All right, tonight. But so check this out. We are on week two of our series, The Comeback. Someone say, Come back. And tonight we're going to be talking about one of the craziest stories in the Bible. And that is, of course, about the prodigal son. All right. And it's a story found in Luke chapter 15. Okay. We're going to read it together and we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. I'm so excited. Uh, that we're going to be doing something really, really awesome. But here we go. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. If you have your Bibles, open it up. If you don't, it's all good. We have it on the screen, okay? Yay, technology. But it says this. Jesus continued. This is Jesus telling the story. There was a, a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Have you ever met a spoiled rich kid? Okay, this is, this is that spoiled rich kid right now. Now, I don't know if you knew how this works, okay, but normally when people die, they leave you an inheritance, right? That's kind of how it works. You die, whatever, okay? So this son was going, Dad, listen. You're not dead, but uh, that money you owed me when you do that, I want it now. Like, how, like, what a jerk, right? Can we all agree that this dude sounds like a jerk in this Bible right now? It says this, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. So he was doing everything he could possibly imagine with, with, with drugs and, and, and prostitution, all those different things happening, all right, in this story, insane, right? So after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land, in that whole country, and he began to be in need. He realized that, oh, snap, uh, I don't have any more money. This is what happened. So, verse 15 so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. Okay, now check this out. Back in the day, feeding the pigs was like super, like the lowest grade job you can possibly think of. This, this young dude, he, he went from spoiled rich kid to feeding the pigs. Talk about losing your worth losing your worthiness. In fact, in 16, it got so bad. Check this out. It was so bad, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Imagine being so hungry that you go over to a farm. We have lots of farms around here. And you know that disgusting slop that they feed the pigs? Imagine being so hungry that you want to eat that. How crazy is that? So here we go, verse 17. When he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So his plan was to go back to his dad and be like, Dad, I'm sorry. I've, I am nothing right now. 
let me be your servant. Let me be your slave. Because right now you treat, you treat your hired people better than I'm being treated right now. So in verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for, for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, this is where it gets amazing. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. You see, the ring was significant because that, that, that ring was a symbol that he belonged again to, to the family. And then it, then it continues, bring the fattened calf and kill it. So how many guys know that if you kill a whole cow and you're about to have a barbecue, it's a party. Anyone like that? Anyone else have barbecue here? I love barbecue so much. I'm also fat. Anyways. So, so, uh, so he says, for his son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So here we have this son who sinned greatly but was embraced again by, by his father. It's a very powerful story, but I wanted to actually uh, have someone tonight come and help me uh, speak to this. Someone who has actually lived this story out. Uh, I can't wait to bring her out here. When she comes out here, go, yay, clap her hair. But she's amazing. She's incredible. Uh, why don't you give it up for Kelly as she comes over here. Kelly Rodriguez, ladies and gentlemen. Yay. What's I know, it is very bright. Kelly, she is the high school director over at our Warwick campus. And uh, she's amazing. And really has quite a crazy, crazy story. And uh, so, Kelly, first of all, thanks for even like, be being, being here, for one. So um, let's kind of like jump into it. So we went over the story of the prodigal. So let me ask you this. What, what did your childhood look like? I mean, you're so holy and Christ-like now. Like surely you came from a Christian home or were you like, how, how, how was that growing up? No, not really. Um, so my mom is from Texas. And so she was Southern Baptist. And uh, my dad was in the Navy and was, got stationed in Texas. Met, met my mom, brought her back here, and he was, like, strict Catholic. So the agreement was that I would be raised Catholic. Um, so we didn't really go to service, but we went to church um, on Christmas, Easter. Easter yeah. um, we did get put into CCD classes, so we did all those kind of ritual all classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conf yeah ritual. Confirmation yeah. and stuff. Um, but, you know, God knew where I needed to be. And so on the right of me and on the left of me, I had two Christian neighbors, and they both had daughters and sons my ages. And so I ended up going to two different kinds of churches. So I was hearing okay. the word of God, um, not in my home, but through, through my neighbors. Um, my dad, um, he had quite the temper. And as I grew older, he, um, I guess, maybe felt more freer to kind of have these tantrums and kind of release that anger onto myself and my mother. Um, he, would, he would yell so loud that, like, spit would be hitting my face. He'd be, like, right up in my face just kind of oh, yelling geez. and um, throwing objects. You know, he'll, he'll claim, you know, I never hit you guys, but, you know, a toaster would come flying, my, you know, at my wow. mom or I or something like that, whatever he could, he could grab. Um, if we giggled at dinner and he didn't like it, the hand came down on the table and everything kind of just, you know, jumped up in the air. Um, um, so he was kind of uh, a little bit nasty. Um, he didn't drink. People thought maybe he was an alcoholic, but he wasn't. He didn't drink. Um, he just had some major, ma major anger issues. Um, I do have a sister who's six years younger than me. And at that time, um, when I've talked to my mom about it, she always said, I never meant for you to get the brunt of it. I just thought he would change when you were born. So she really took my sister and kind of had her under her wing and, and protected her a lot from that. So she's six years younger than me. Um, basically, after my sister was born, my dad would look at a, mostly me and say, you know, 
I had two girls, but I wanted two boys. And he treated us like that. We, we were definitely made known to, to feel like that. Um, I do have happy memories. I have memories of, you know, it was like back then when everybody was outside, no cell phone, no internet or anything. So I have memories of riding bikes up and down the street, you know, playing army in the, in the field next to us, building forts, playing in the stream, oh, yeah. you know, a lot of neighborhood kind of get togethers and stuff like that. But for me, um, despite some of those great memories, there's still always this kind of cloud or this darkness or this kind of weird feeling for me when I think of my childhood. And that's mostly um, because I think of my dad's behavior, you know, someone who I thought was going to protect and love me no matter what was kind of making me feel the opposite. Um, he made me feel like I was nothing, kind of like he didn't want me to exist. Um, it's like verbal abuse. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, because I felt that way and I was so shy and vulnerable, I kind of just, as I got into middle school, let that mold me. And I tried to fit in. I tried to, like, you know, we didn't have a, tons of money, so I couldn't buy all, you know, have the latest fashions, but I would try to fit in. But no matter what I did, it, it wasn't good enough. And basically, um, I was made fun of a lot because I was underdeveloped and had buck teeth and braces. And just like Bon Jovi, like crazy hair too, but oh, that wow. was cool. That was, yeah, that, that was, was cool. Yeah. No, it's okay, in middle school I was fat and I had a Coke bottle glasses and had a speech <laughs> impediment and I was dyslexic, okay. so like I, seriously. So I'm not alone. <laughs> so yeah, I totally feel you like on that and that, gosh, but just, just thinking about like your dad and just everything he said to you, I mean, that had a, I'm sure you had scars because of that. Like, you, you felt worthless. So how, how did you see that feeling of, of, of worthlessness play out in, in your middle school and, I guess, high school years? Yeah. Well, because I wasn't – I didn't have good self-esteem. I never did. I mean, even being on front here on a stage, like, in my mind, I want to say that's not me. You know, now I know God's going to put me where he wants me, and I'm going to do the best I can to his glory. But then it was like, don't put me in front anywhere. I, I'm not worthy. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not fashionable enough. I, it's just, it's not me. So what I did was I just wanted to fit in anywhere. I wanted to have that feeling of just belonging or have someone pay attention to me and someone like me. And that would be males. So I would do anything, you know, to get male attention. And I let them treat me however they wanted to. So you're talking like maybe the end of sixth grade into seventh grade, and um, I was being abused by boys. Um, there's one in particular that I can remember who um, thought it was funny in between classes to push me as hard as he could against the lockers so that my head would you know, bang a few times and I could feel it ringing in my ears. Um, there was another boy, and I still remember the hallway, where he just thought it another thing would be fun is to just see how high he could get me off the ground by picking me up by my neck. Um, you know, and I just did nothing. I never did anything. I thought any attention was good attention for me, even unhealthy attention. Um, soon, because um, I kind of grew up in a, in a class where we had a lot of older friends, so a lot of things were really easy accessible to me. So, um, you know, guys would introdu introduce me to marijuana, so I would smoke marijuana. Um, you know, you started drinking, doing the keg stands, doing everything because they wanted you to. So if they wanted you to do something, I was going to do it. Soon, the marijuana and the drinking just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough escape for me. Um, I did acid, tried that a few times. It still wasn't enough. It wasn't lasting. It wasn't you know, fulfilling me. It still wasn't giving me the needs that I needed. So um, I met someone that had introduced me to um, crack cocaine. So that became my addiction. That became like what I needed because I got a high off that and I could control it. Wow. And it, it made me feel good at the time or so I thought. Um, I was afraid of my father. So I still kind of played a part I was able to, for a long time, live two separate lives. So um, I was a basketball and football cheerleader. I um, 
did ballet classes. I worked at a daycare um, and did great at my job. I did the best I could with school. I was never great in school, but I did the best I would school. Anything to keep off my parents' radar. Um, my mom at the time, by the time I was 14, decided because my father didn't take us to church anymore, she was going to take us to church. So we found a great small church, and I loved it there, but it, it wasn't enough. It didn't fit what I was doing. So I liked it, and I pretend, and I got involved there. I, I did certain small ministries at 14 and 15 that I could do, um, but I just got really good at acting, and that's what I was doing. So living a double life, like you were doing all this stuff outside of church, but then you mm -hmm. put on a brave face. Yeah, yeah, Man. absolutely. Because there was a fear of getting caught, because at the time, that was my escape. That was the only thing I had, or so I thought. So there was this fear that I had to act so it didn't get taken away from me. Wow. Um, now, with everything, with drugs and everything, you think you can control it, but you can't. It's a sin. It grows. It gets bigger. It became all-encompassing in my life. So I started slipping. Um, I ran away a bunch of times. Um, my job, I started, um, I actually started stealing cash from my mom. I knew where she kept her savings, and she kept cash, so I would steal cash from my mom. I forged checks from my parents' checks book because I didn't have wow. enough money. I lost my job. Um, so I was stealing and doing whatever I could um, to feed my addiction. I remember buying, I was so proud of myself because it was the first year I could buy Christmas presents for people. I remember going and buying presents and then I ran out of money and I went to Toys R Us and returned everything that I got because I needed the money for drugs. Um, wow. I lived with people I didn't know. I, I ran away numerous times. Um, I just couldn't, I felt trapped, so I just ran. So, um, you know, there were people, I couldn't even tell you to this day who they were, but I live with people. Um, I look for comfort basically in whatever form I could get it, whether it was drugs, whether it was hurting myself. I was super destructive to myself. So like um, self-harm. Self-harm, kind of, yeah. yep, on my inner arms and on my, on my legs here. I would carve words and, you know, just whatever it was mm. to pain. If, if something happened where I did like a guy and I thought it was going to go well and then it didn't go well, I would like bang my head against the wall and just anything I could do to just wow. not feel pain and feel rejected again. So, th so during all of this, like you're, you're going to church, ha did, did anyone from church try to reach out and try to help you at all? Yeah, well, that was crazy too because I was still going to youth group at the time <laughs> too. <laughs> and, um, you know, people started noticing and my parents the whole time, I mean, obviously up until I started running away, they didn't really know anything. Um, I love them. You know, we've had some restoration, but we weren't really involved. We weren't like a family that talked to each other. We, oh you know, gosh. I could, my father made an addition and my room was upstairs and that was my spot and their spot was all the way on the other side of the house. So I could do whatever I want. I snuck out in the middle of the night. They had no idea that I would take their car and just be gone all night and come back drunk and high. Like they had no idea. Um, so youth group kind of became, um, like that family that I didn't feel a part of. And so I did have certain people there that were kind of like, you're acting strange or, you know, they would say little things to me. There was this one guy there that, um, you know, he just really always asked, how you doing? Every time I got there, how you doing? Are you okay? Is everything going okay? You know, can I pray with you? And honestly, he skeeved me out. I was like, just get away from me. Like, I don't want you near me. I don't like you. I don't know why you want to pray with me. But as my addiction got worse, I got nastier and nastier. But I mm. really couldn't stand the guy. And I didn't understand, like, wow. why God placed him in my life because he was just annoying and kind of screwing up what I wanted to do in my life. Um, one time, um, by junior year, I ran into this guy. In, in the, I'm, I'm from Warwick. And so um, I met this older guy, and I was so excited because he wasn't really attractive, but he had the proper ID, he, he had a car, and he was known to be a drug addict in Warwick. And when he showed interest in, in me, I thought I scored big because, you know, I'm going to get stuff. One way or another, I'm going to get stuff. Wow. So... Um, we decided that, you know, I wasn't even going to go back my senior year. He was going to take me to Washington, D.C., and we were going to live happily ever after. Wow, drop so, out of high school, everything, just, just run. Just, yeah, so that was kind of like somewhere between junior year and senior year. Man. So um, 
when I had to, the following summer before, and, and I do mess up my timeline a little, guys, because my memories go in and out, and I don't really remember everything, but I know somewhere between junior year and before my senior year, my parents, someone had to tell my parents, something is wrong with your daughter. And um, I had uh, my pastor and a few of the youth group members, they, they had a meeting with me, and I denied everything, but it, it eventually came out. So my parents tried to put me in a rehab. Um, my mom came to visit, and I was so angry that when she came, my mom's a little, little thing, and I grabbed the keys from her hand, and I was like, they have a um, trip, a field trip to Action Park, so if you don't get in the car with me, they'll, they'll get you close enough to home. Like, I, I just didn't care. So wow. I basically just took myself out of rehab, and, and that was it. Um, wow. Yeah. And then so. I, I, I moved out, and then um, that, that guy that was praying for me, he allowed me to, to stay with him for a little bit. Wow. So, so lots of drugs happening, and... Was it was the boyfriend guy? Was he a drug addict or was he a drug dealer? He was both. Oh, he was yeah. both. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. And so you're you're going to church and everything. So you knew about Jesus. Yes. So kind of going back to the story, did you ever remember a point where you were just where, where you felt like you were too far gone? Well, yes, I did. I mean, there there was a time. Um, Because we went to the city a lot. And um, there was a time um, when I remember, I mean, you know, you hear this, I've heard this in a few testimonies when people talk about, you know, how God has transformed their lives. Some people will say, I can't believe I'm alive. Well, I'm truly saying I can't believe a lie. We drove high and drunk so many times back and forth to the city. Like, I don't know how we didn't get caught or how we didn't hurt ourselves or someone else. That escalated for me. Like, I needed more. I needed more. I needed more. I would, like, hide drugs so that my, my boyfriend at the time thought they were gone. But I would hide the, the little glass vials and say, no, we, we smoked it all because I needed some for by myself, but I couldn't afford it, you know? So I had yeah. to kind of, like, be sneaky and stuff. Um, I, I have specific memories of being in crack houses. Um, I can still kind of smell it. I can still see it. I can feel the smokiness in the air. And uh, at one time, that, that boyfriend that supposedly loved me so much, you know, he must have been a little short on cash because he left me on the side of some block in, in Manhattan and told me, earn money, and, like, left me for two hours. And, you know, I thank God for his protection, and I didn't do anything, but, you know, that's what he that's thought of me. That's how desperate, yeah. Yeah. And thought of you as worthless. Yeah. Gosh. So when, when did you finally decide that enough was enough? And um, Brian, I don't know where Brian is, but if you get somebody on keys, that'd be great. Yeah. So one specific memory I have is um, being taken to that crack house. I remember the dealer that was there. He was in a wheelchair. It was dark. It was dingy. Um, he, there were two women, like, strung out in the room, just on a mattress on the floor. We got our stuff. And we went upstairs. And these rooms and these places, are all they are is like a bunch of seats, like a bunch of couches, um, you know, and just strung out people everywhere. When you open the door, there's just clouds and clouds of smoke. So um, myself and my boyfriend sat down, and you just pass. We just were passing the pipe and passing the pipe and just smoking and smoking. And I just remember thinking, and I've never, I, I'm, I'm a pretty petite girl, like, you know, never overweight or anything. So, you know, I would sit there and take probably triple, double, or quadruple of what I should have been able to take in and, and not have any medical problems. But the one night that I was just kind of like, I didn't, I didn't want to do this anymore, and I didn't know how to stop it, um, I remember getting the pipe passed to me. And I took my hit, and I took a, a pretty strong hit, and I remember feeling the burning sensation in my fingers and not being able to let go and thinking, Kelly, let go. Pass it. Pass it. And I couldn't do it. My, my joints had basically frozen up. And so now I'm getting yelled at, and all this chaos is happening, and my boyfriend finally grabbed it from my fingers and, and took it. 
and he's yelling at me, and he's telling me, get up. We're leaving. We're leaving. I'm acting stupid, and get up, get up, get up. You know, you're going to get us hurt. You're going to get us killed, you know, because that's a, yeah. you know, a no-no. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't move. I couldn't even speak. I remember my jaw feeling locked, my, my fingers, my knees, everything, my elbows, even my shoulders. I, I couldn't move. And I thought, I'm going to die here. I'm going to die. And um, he picked me up, threw me over his shoulder. I remember getting smacked around on the walls because they were skinny hallways. And, and he took me outside. And we, we got home. By the grace of God, we got home. And he dropped me off at my friend's house. Um, my friend told him to leave. He wanted to stay the night. And he said, no, I'll make sure Kelly's okay. Um, you need to leave. Um, a, a day or so later, I, the timeline is a little iffy for me, but I remember um, thinking, I need another hit, but I can't do it anymore, and just feeling this internal battle. I called someone. Again, I don't remember who I called or how I got there, but I ended up on the front step of my youth um, leader's house, house, and that friend came out and he was like what are you doing what are you doing like you're physically a wreck I can tell you're emotionally a wreck you know what do you when are you gonna stop and I just broke down in tears and uh, he started praying over me and that day I gave up my, my drug addiction I didn't just give it up I gave up everything. I turned away from those people that were bad influences in my life. I broke up with, with my boyfriend. I went home to my parents' house. I became a sister to my sister and a daughter to my parents. And I, I went back to youth group free and clear with hardly any withdrawal symptoms from drugs. So that, that friend in youth group that had talked to you and tried to help you and stuff, whatever did happen to him? <laughs> well, that guy that I couldn't stand that I met when I was 14 years old, he proposed to me when I was 18, and we got married when I was 19, wow. which I'm not saying do that, okay, but, <laughs> um, and he has been my husband for 26 years, three beautiful sons later. Wow. Um, yeah, we can clap for that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So like so when so when the the story of the prodigal son I mean obviously in this case it's the prodigal daughter but like when, when you when you read that story what emotions and feelings do you I was actually surprised how emotional I got and it came to mind too and and you know for like the the couple of Warwick students that are here you know you may have heard pieces of my testimony before and I would say you know especially with scripture you know at preschool. You, you've heard Noah's, the story of Noah's Ark. You've heard the, the birth story, uh, you know, Christmas story. You've heard certain parables like yeah. the prodigal son over and over and over. And you know what, guys? Never not listen because God reveals things to you when you least expect it. And the prodigal son, when, when originally when Chris asked me to read it, I was going to speak by myself. And um, I said, you know, this hit me different, Chris. This hit me different this time. You know, um, I thought of the father in the parable. He didn't make his son go to him. He didn't make his son hang his head in shame and kind of like maybe with his foot tapping like, uh-huh, I told you so. Mm -hmm. I knew you'd be back. You know, he, he wasn't like that. He wasn't doing that to his father. I mean, to his son, I'm sorry. But instead, his father return, uh, rejoiced in his son's return. He went running to his son. It didn't matter what he did or, or the sins that he committed when he was gone. He was forgiven, and he was forgiven joyfully. And that, that hit me really strong. His father embraced him. His father celebrated him. And God was with me during my time. You know, I was talking about my Christian neighbors, and one of them at eight years old, I remember a sleepover, and she said to me, Kelly, 
you know, do you know who God is? I've been bringing you to church, but do you know who he is? And she helped me accept Jesus, my Lord and Savior, at eight years old. I felt God with me even in the darkest places. I didn't know if I was going to make it out. And believe me, there are some stories. I have two friends that didn't, that can't sit here today and tell you the story that I can tell and tell you of God's redemptive blood and how he redeemed me. Everybody's story is different. God was with me. He was with me in the darkest, most shameful places that I've been. He was with me in the darkest things that I did and the darkest things that I said. And he forgave it all. And he celebrated me and he embraced me when I turned from sin. When I turned from sin. Guys, we have a responsibility there too. We have to turn from our sin. And I thank God that he has never stopped pursuing me. He's a pursuing God. I also think of the godly people that he sent in my life during that time, my husband, Joe. But also, my pastor was aware of things that I was going through. And when I was living that double life, there was a time when I stopped everything. I stopped ministry because my addiction was so deep. And I remember this feeling like, I have to go to church today. I was still high from the day before, but I have to go to church today. Again, I got a ride from somebody, I don't know. Went late because I didn't want to talk to anybody. Sat in the very back, heard my pastor, knew they were going to start the last song, and said, ooh, I got to get out of here. I don't want to talk to anybody. So I remember going down the steps, going to the farthest edge of the parking lot I could, waiting for my ride. And I'm sitting there, you know, fiddling. And I'm like, all right, hurry up, hurry up. I don't want to talk to people. They're going to come in the parking lot soon. I got to get out of here. And I hear, Kelly, Kelly, like I hear someone yelling my name and I turn around and it's my pastor and he was literally running down the cement steps and across the parking lot and I thought oh here we go here we go he's gonna lecture me he's gonna tell me you know what am I doing you're you're hurting your parents you're you know this and that and he just like ran up to me grabbed my hand and said it's so good to see you I've been praying for you I love you be safe and the prodigal son brought that up for me as well. Like the physical representation. You know, we're supposed to be Jesus, Jesus' feet. And at the time, that was my pastor. That was Jesus running towards me saying, my daughter, my daughter, I love you. I have forgiven you. Your slate is clean because you have turned from those sins. Me a favor, why don't we get up for Kelly for sharing that amazing testimony real quick? Just thank you so much. You're so amazing. And, uh, do me a favor. Uh, why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me all across this place? We're gonna crash on this thing here right now. But here's the deal. I, I I know we're in church. I know you registered to be here and all that. But listen, I I don't want to assume that everyone in this place right now is, is, is at a good place with God right now. Maybe right now, your story is kind of like Kelly's where she would go to church and she would still be battling this something. If that's you tonight, I wanna give you an opportunity to turn away from your sin. However small it might be, however big it might be, who cares? So with every single head bowed, every single eye closed in this room if you can say you know what Pastor Chris I want to turn away from my sin I want to be different I, I want a fresh start and I need Jesus if that's you on the count of three I want you to just put up your hand every single head bowed every single eye closed here we go one two I need to turn away from my sin one two Thank you for your honesty. You guys can put your hands down. Now, 
not only do I see that, but guess what? God sees that too. So for those of you who raised your hand, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. And you're going to repeat it after me. And you might be thinking, oh, man, that's awkward. No, 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 no. The rest of us, we're going to say this prayer with you. Because when you walk out of here, I want you to know that that there's a, there's a God who loves you and has your back, but there's also a church that loves you and has your back. So everyone across this place, say this prayer. Repeat after me and mean it, guys. If you raise your hand, mean it. Say this, dear Lord Jesus. Come on, say it like you mean it, y'all. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I'm sorry for my sin, my mistakes, my mess-ups. God, make me a new person. Walk with me and help me to be more like you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And real quick, with every single head bowed, every single eye closed, Kelly just shared this incredible testimony. And if you're really honest, you may have some friends who you know are totally and completely away from God. So if you're in this room and you have and you have a friend who desperately needs Jesus, without even counting three, could you just raise up your hand? If you have somebody in your life that desperately needs Jesus, okay, just a couple of hands going up across this room, okay. I'm going to pray for your friend. But for those of you who raise your hand, I'm also going to pray for you to have boldness to talk to your friend about Jesus. It doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, you know what? Invite that friend next week, for reals. It don't matter. We love everyone here. But let me pray for you. Let me pray for everyone. And then, then we're going to dismiss. But God, I just thank you so much for every single young person in this room, Jesus. Thank you so much for your love and compassion. God, I pray for those people who have friends who are far away from you. God, I pray that you would just fill them with a burden for them. God, I pray that they would pray for their friends, that they would also tell, tell their friends about you, Jesus, that they would invite them here, Father. God, we know that there's so many prodigal sons and prodigal daughters out there in this world. Father, I pray, God, that that our county, that our, our little villages, our little towns, Father, that they would turn away from their sins and turn to you, Father. We love you. Bless every single person here. And if you're with me, say amen. Come on, say amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise in this place. Come on with somebody. Hey, we love you. Um, Kelly, I'm going to ask you to kind of blitz over to that prayer room. So here's the deal. Uh, we're going to dismiss my section. If you need prayer, we're going to have leaders in that room. Before you exit out of the glass doors on this side of the building, there's a little room over there. If you need prayer, we have leaders that are there for you. If you want to talk to Kelly specifically, she'll be there. Maybe you can relate to her or anything. But um, at this time, I'm going to be dismissing uh, my section. I let this section go first last week. So this section, you guys may go. We love you guys so much. This section, you guys can go ahead and leave. Thank you guys so much. We love you guys so much. See you next week. We'll see you next week. Remember your mask. Remember social distancing. That's good. All right. This section, I love you guys so much. Listen, I'm a weird pastor and I get that, but I love you guys so much. I hope you know that. So stand up and you guys are dismissed at this time. And then uh, the first shall be last, or in this case, you're just last, okay? But I love you guys so much. It's always good seeing you. Have a good day at school uh, or at home at school type thing. But we love you guys. We will see you all next week. Thank you.